This video has been rated T for Tomb. 25 years ago, a teal top wearing, dual pistol shooting, tomb raiding badass adventurer made her entrance and took the world by storm. Tomb Raider made a huge impact with its groundbreaking gameplay and inspirational heroine Lara Croft and went on to spawn a series of sequels making it one of the most successful 90s gaming franchises. Lara Croft became one of the all-time greatest video gaming icons, still relevant to this day. I think the key to the Tomb Raider series' greatness, well, besides Lara of course, is the levels we got to explore in the games. These levels came in all shapes, styles and sizes, took us all across the globe and simply stand as the foundation of an excellent action-adventure series. The first game revolutionized 3D level design by having the player explore big complex levels. The second game featured more linear level design with a bigger emphasis on combat and vehicular gameplay. The third game introduced far greater non-linearity and often big sprawling levels with more unforgiving environmental dangers. I want to rank all the levels of the original Tomb Raider trilogy. This is no easy task, but I'm ready for it. I count 69 levels across the three main games and their respective expansions as well as the tutorial level Lara's Home. I'll loosely be judging the levels on certain criteria like aesthetics, gameplay and level design, but ultimately it all comes down to how fun the level is. This makes it possible for even shorter levels to compete with the typical endurance test-like levels on the longer side, as the overall impression will be the most important factor. I'm strictly sticking to the pre-Last Revelation games, as I think the Last Revelation marked a point in the series where the level design started to deviate from the original formula. I might rank the other levels someday, but for now it's all about that original trilogy. Like I said, this will not be easy and some difficult choices will be made. Some of these choices for low ranking levels will probably get me on the bad side of some of you, but please, lower your pitchforks. I don't think there are two Tomb Raider fans in the world who have identical level rankings. No matter how much you disagree with my choices, I hope you'll enjoy the video. Here we go. Number 69. Nightmare in Vegas. Coming in last is Nightmare in Vegas, and it's not just Lara that's having a nightmare here. Nightmare in Vegas comes across as the product of someone at Core Design screwing around. It's obvious that the level isn't meant to be taken seriously, and I see what it's trying to do. But I just don't think this kind of kitchen sink level design fits Tomb Raider. To me, the level comes across as something someone made in a level editor, as opposed to a level that was designed by a seasoned Tomb Raider level designer. I kind of love that Lara's butler Winston has joined her on this adventure though. As always, his purpose in life is to serve Lara T and no Italian mobster, giant birdman or friggin T-Rex is going to stop him. Winston follows Lara everywhere to serve her tea, and I mean everywhere. Jeez Winston. Also, why does Lara have a direct satellite feed to Winston's hotel bathroom? Like what the f*** uh -huh. Lara? Nightmare in Vegas has some amusing moments, but the level is too random and insane for my taste. Despite all the wacky stuff in the level, it's surprisingly boring from a gameplay standpoint, and aesthetically it might be the ugliest level in the series. It is an uncannon bonus level though, so I guess it's forgivable. Number 68. The Deck. The deck is a level that feels like a chore to play through and it's always a low point in my Tomb Raider 2 playthroughs. To put it shortly, this level is a pain in the ass. Let me get the positives out of the way first. The idea of a shipwreck being stuck in an underground cave is so cool, although it presents a continuity error as the wreck somehow isn't upside down here. Also, it's a more coherent level than Nightmare in Vegas, so there's that. And that's it for the positives. In general, Tomb Raider 2 is the most linear of the classic Tomb Raider games, but this level is an exception. Unsuccessfully, I might add. The deck feels like a giant void where the level design doesn't dictate any sort of objective or goal to the player. Instead, the player is just left wandering aimlessly around this massive cave, potentially for hours. On top of that, the level doesn't look very good. It has a very uniform appearance from start to finish with little to no variation whatsoever. That would probably be okay if I didn't spend so much time in the level every time I played it. Or if it at least was a pretty exotic location. You know what, at this point, 
I think it's only fair to rename this level the Dick. I'm out. Number 67. All Hallows. All Hallows is a secret bonus level in Tomb Raider 3 that is awarded to the player for finding all of the game's 72 secrets. Considering how hard you need to work to unlock this level, it's disappointing how little it has to offer. While it has a rather memorable setting inside a cathedral with a unique atmosphere, the cathedral feels abstract and nonsensical in its structure. And from a gameplay standpoint, All Hallows is entirely forgettable. Essentially, you're just pulling switches around the cathedral with a few traps here and there, including a devious zip line that will take you to your death. The level is basically unfinished, which explains why it feels underdeveloped in certain areas, like this random jump scare. It was meant to be the second level of the London section, in between Thames, Wharf and Aldwych, but it was cut due to time constraints. This is really a shame, as I think the London section suffers without it due to how perfectly it would have bridged those two levels. On a more positive note, the level picks up for me towards the end when Lara passes through a sewer with floating corpses. This is genuinely creepy and would have perfectly set up the London section's later narrative development, had it been part of the main game. Oh, well. Number 66. The Dragon's Lair. The finale of Tomb Raider 2 is a memorable one, with Lara finally taking on Marco Bartoli. But holy shit, he transforms into a giant dragon after thrusting the dagger of Xi'an into his heart. The dragon's breath must be avoided at all costs, but besides that, the battle is rather straightforward. The dragon will collapse after having taken a certain amount of damage and at this point it's crucial that the player will reach it in time to pull the dagger out of its chest. Once Marco the Italian dragon has been defeated, the lair will start collapsing, which is actually my favorite moment of the level. At this point in the series, it seemed as if a collapsing final level was to be a tradition, equal to Resident Evil's tendency to always have a lab blow up at the end of their games. I feel it's worth noting that from this level and onwards, I don't consider the levels bad any longer. Instead, there'll just be a dozen levels or so that are flawed rather than downright bad. And since we're only a couple of levels into this ranking, I'd say that's a testament to the greatness of these levels. Number 65. Meteorite Cavern. The cavern in Tomb Raider 3's final level looks really impressive, but dear god, look at that! Dr. Willard's boss design has not exactly aged well. It's obvious he's supposed to be scary, but he looks completely ridiculous. I like the idea that his obsession with hyperevolution ends like this for him, as I don't think he meant to become a deformed spider. I just don't like the execution of it. The boss fight itself is pretty complicated, as Lara needs to collect the four artifacts again before she can kill Willard. It's crucial to stun him first though, or he'll instantly kill Lara. The ascent out of the cavern is a personal highlight for me with a very nice overview of the cavern itself as well as the beautiful snow falling through the opening. Out in the snow, the player is given the opportunity to use whatever ammo there is left on the remaining mercenaries before the game ends, which is awesome of course. Actually, the more I talk about this level, the more I kind of like it. It's difficult for these short levels to size up against the typical Tomb Raider levels, but Meteorite Cavern does a decent job of it. Number 64. RX Tech Mines. The Tomb Raider games often venture into horror-like scenarios, and RX Tech Mines is a truly scary example of this. We find Laura deep within a dark mine underneath the snowy surface of Antarctica, and this place is full of mutants and has a very disturbing atmosphere. A memorable part of the level is when Laura enters a dark steam room that has a very unsettling vibe. There are giant mutants roaming these corridors, and they are absolutely terrifying. But while RX Tech Mines definitely has something going for it in terms of atmosphere, it lacks heavily in gameplay. The main gameplay of the level is navigating three different minecart tracks while gathering certain items that will help Lara progress. These minecart rides feel wonky, and they will, more often than not, lead you to frustrating deaths. I really don't like these minecart rides, and since they take up a lot of the level, they heavily influence my perception of it. The level does redeem itself towards the end with a super difficult challenge. 
Lara must dive deep into the mine's underground lake to reach the lost city of Tinnus. Keeping Lara from freezing to death is a true puzzle, but the level designer has placed helpful little lamps within the lake to guide the player if they pay attention. I think this is rather ingenious level design, and when Lara finally emerges at the other end of the lake, you feel like you've really accomplished something. Number 63. Offshore Rig. As Lara wakes up in her offshore rig prison cell, the player is treated with Tomb Raider 2's version of the No Weapons level. Unfortunately, it doesn't get this type of level right. First of all, why is the lever to open the prison cell within the actual prison cell? This woman can pull solid rock blocks, so it's not like these crates would ever stop her from reaching that lever. Anyways, Lara escapes and she has no weapons, so you'd think this would require a more careful approach to the level, right? Well, Lara gets her trusty pistols back within minutes, so you never get to feel like you are in any danger and need to approach this level differently. Since you get your weapons back so quickly, it doesn't feel very satisfying when you get to kill the couple of enemies that could have bothered you before. The no weapons levels are actually a personal highlight for me in the other games, but Offshore Rig simply botches its take on the challenge. While the level definitely suffers from this, I do somewhat enjoy exploring the rest of it. The oil rig isn't the most engaging environment, but it was interesting to see Lara in this type of environment at the time. Number 62. The Cold War. The levels from the Tomb Raider expansions typically have a certain unique character to them, often applying out of the box level design, like the Cold War, which opens by simply dropping Lara from the sky into the Bering Sea. Besides that though, the Cold War is surprisingly middle of the road, except for a stunning backdrop depicting the Northern Lights. Following a slow start, Lara eventually makes her way to an abandoned Soviet military base, where lots of enemies begin appearing. The Skidoo from the Tibet section of Tomb Raider 2 returns here, but this level is not a great level for riding it. In fact, the Skidoo ends up feeling more like a nuisance due to the fact that there's usually not much room to ride it, and that you often find yourself under gunfire from enemies that have higher vantage points. I will say this though, there is an absolutely splendid secret area in this level, taking the shape of some magical ice temple within a glacier. This temple is guarded by knights who are friendly as long as you don't attack them. Of course Lara steals their gold, but at least she helps them fend off the thugs that tailed her there. The Cold War is one of those Tomb Raider levels that lack a certain spark that makes it stand out. Besides its secret area, it's almost entirely forgettable. Number 61. Lost City of Tinnus. The Antarctica section of Tomb Raider 3 is taking quite the pummeling in my ranking here, which is a shame since I think it has some good ideas. Lost City of Tinnus has the right idea by placing Lara back in an ancient place after a series of modern locations. The level just wants to do way too much without fully delivering on anything, sadly. While I love the idea of the four elemental trials, those are just a tiny part of an enormous level that primarily is very frustrating and uninteresting. And it's not like the trials are perfect either. The water trial is too difficult, the earth trial feels clumsy, and I struggle to see how a maze correlates to the element of air. I do really like the fire trial however, where you need to reveal a hidden map by lighting a flare which will tell you what pillars you can use to cross a lava pool. Lost City of Tinnus means well, but it has a fatal flaw that dooms it to its low placing in this ranking. Wasps. These infinitely spawning green motherfuckers uh -huh. will ruin your life, working hard to make your time in this level as miserable as goddamn possible. If you happen to trigger the spawn point in one specific chamber towards the end of the level, good uh -huh. luck. This chamber is difficult enough without wasps, so take a guess how great it is when they constantly push you off platforms. Oh, Lost City looks great, it's great atmosphere, but I just don't like playing it. Done. Number 60. Ice Palace. I've noticed that I'm putting a lot of snow themed levels near the bottom here. That's not very ice of me. Ice Palace just doesn't stand out much, even though it is a rather sizable level for a boss level. The level introduces jump pads, which, while fun, seems somewhat misplaced in the Tomb Raider game. These jump pads play an essential part in the first half of the level before it transitions towards a more grounded approach. 
There's a nice moment later on where Lara travels through an area from the previous level, which is followed by a pretty cool interaction with an area you couldn't reach in that level. The level begins to pick up for me when Lara gradually closes in on the Ice Palace itself, with the surroundings becoming less influenced by civilization. As expected, there are numerous enemies and environmental dangers for Lara to survive here, such as yetis and an avalanche. The Ice Palace itself is a rare example of the classic Tomb Raider graphics actually working against it, as the palace isn't as visually impressive as its name suggests. On top of that, the sole resident of this palace is in the shape of a rather ridiculous looking giant bird monster who serves as the boss of the area. Overall, this is a pretty anticlimactic ending to the Tibet section. Number 59. The Cistern. The first appearance of the original Tomb Raider game on this list is in the shape of the Cistern. The whole sewer aesthetic of the level with its multiple shades of grey and mossy green is a bit of an acquired taste. The level has tough competition from the grease levels that came before it and it's simply not as engaging as those were. That's not the main reason why it is so low for me though. The Cistern is a very confusing level to navigate and it's easy to get lost as everything looks similar. The main gameplay mechanic of the level is to play around with the water levels of the area, making previously inaccessible areas accessible. The level's biggest sin, however, is the ability to softlock yourself if you happen to investigate a certain side room before raising the water level. If you haven't been careful with your saves, this can ruin your game. The cistern in general isn't great, but I do have a soft spot for it, as it is a level I liked a lot as a kid. It has a certain presence that I like, which the rat-infested background track helps manifest. Speaking of rats, the rats in this place are huge, gross and scary. Imagining how old this place is and what function it used to have for the Romans is more exciting than actually playing it though. Number 58. Atlantean Stronghold. I've never been a fan of the visual presentation of the Atlantis levels in the original Tomb Raider game. While I applaud the designers for being very creative with their interpretation of Atlantis, I also don't really want my Atlantis to look like Belial from the Basket Case movies, or Freddy Krueger's skin for a less obscure reference. Of course, this particular look plays into the storyline of the first game perfectly, but I would have preferred something more conventional. Atlantean Stronghold is similar to the Atlantis level of the main game, but adopts a more horizontal design as opposed to the iconic vertical design of that level. Atlantean Stronghold is not a favorite of mine, however, as I simply find the layout very confusing. The level is also on the more combat heavy side, and combat is my least favorite aspect of the classic games. The level does, however, have an absolutely amazing ending and perhaps the greatest swan dive location in the series. Not only does this swan dive require precision to pull off, but Lara will dive past previous areas of the level, which is a nice touch. Number 57. 40 Fathoms. As soon as 40 Fathoms begins, Lara faces potential death by drowning. Starting a level by having the game instantly chip away at Lara's underwater breath meter is quite unfair, especially when you don't know where to locate the entrance to the shipwreck. Once Lara makes it inside to catch her well-earned breath, it becomes an entirely different type of level based around exploration and light puzzle solving. In the later levels of the Maria Doria section, the player gets to explore the truly interesting parts of the wreck, but 40 Fathoms exclusively ties the player to exploring the rusty engine areas at the bottom of the ship, or well, top of the ship in this case, since the wreck is upside down. 40 Fathoms serve as a fine opening level to this section of the game, but it's also quite obvious that it doesn't have a whole lot to offer since the designers saved the fascinating parts of the shipwreck for later. Still, I'm an absolute sucker for the shipwreck levels, well, except for the deck, of course, so I'm happy 40 Fathoms is there. Number 56. Caves. Caves is the level that started it all, the first Tomb Raider experience for millions of people, the one that set the stage for an iconic franchise, and it is... a bit uneventful, really. It's not a bad level, and it completely honors its purpose of easing the player into the game's controls and gameplay. There's just not a whole lot to see and do here, which won't do it many favors in a ranking of levels like this. 
The level does have a few standout moments, like the room with the bridges that is inhabited by wolves. There's also a hidden encounter with a giant bear, which can be completely avoided by successfully jumping over the pit it lives in. I suspect most first-time players failed this jump though and suffered their first ever death at the hands of this bear. Visually, I really like how the lush vegetation sporadically grows in the caves, which stands in stark contrast to the cold setting overall. This vegetation basically functions as early foreshadowing of what's to come two levels later. Besides that though, this level is as generic as they come. I mean, it has bats. Now that's generic. Ultimately, Caves is just there and that's fine, because the series had to start somewhere. Number 55. City. City is a very short level, but it makes up for it by featuring a fun and very different boss encounter. Miss Sophia Lay is not just centuries old, she is wonderfully evil too, and a perfect adversary for Lara. After leaving Miss Lay's office, this level is nothing but a race to the top of London's skyscrapers between her and Lara. Miss Lay attacks Lara with projectiles from her artifacts, so the player needs to constantly be on the move. It's important to look out for her charged attacks in particular, as they do a lot of damage to Lara, on top of the constant danger of falling to your death. This race is quite exhilarating, but there's a nice reward for the player at the end of it. Due to the influence of the artifact, Ms. Lei is immortal to gunfire, but she is not immortal to electricity. Lara needs to lure Ms. Lei onto a certain platform, then shoot a circuit box that will electrify the platform and kill her. It might be the series' most satisfying boss kill due to its gotcha-like nature. City is very short, so it's hard for me to justify it ranking higher than 55th, but it has a lot of personality for such a short level. Number 54. Diving Area. Diving Area improves on its predecessor by completely eliminating the redundant no weapons part and instead gives us the perhaps most action heavy level of the series. Besides giving us numerous enemies to defeat, the level also tasks us with climbing the world's longest ladder. TWICE! I kid you not, this ladder takes an entire minute to climb and it's just as tedious as it sounds. When you're forced to climb it the second time, you just know that level designer is a piece of shit. Overall, the setting feels more dynamic than Offshore Rig did, with more varied gameplay and I must admit that it is a pretty fun level. There are a lot of enemies however, and it does get a bit repetitive towards the end. Some of these bastards even have flamethrowers, which can be a pain in the ass to dodge due to the long range. Like I pointed out earlier, combat is typically my least favorite aspect of the classic Tomb Raider games, but for a level like this it works pretty well. The ending of the level does a nice job of setting the stage for the Tibet section of the game later on, as a very lucky Tibetan monk gets to witness Lara change into her first new outfit of the series. Number 53. The River Ganges. This is a tough level to rank. The level is primarily centered around a vehicle, with Lara getting to ride a quad bike along the banks of the Ganges River. At one point, however, the road forks, and whether you go left or right completely changes what type of experience this is going to be for you. The left path is much shorter and consistently tied to using the quad bike, while the right path is more traditional exploration and platforming based gameplay. This freedom of choice is nice and a hallmark of the level design of Tomb Raider 3, however, in what I consider to be bad level design, you'll miss a secret if you pick the right path. Which I guess makes it the wrong path. If you want all secrets, you have to pick the left path, and that contradicts the non-linear playstyle Tomb Raider 3 promotes. This sucks even more as the left path is easily the worst path from a gameplay standpoint. The quad bike is just not fun to ride because the level doesn't accommodate it. You are always put in situations where you need to carefully navigate the vehicle around tight corners and ledges, which kills the purpose of riding it. It's supposed to be fun! So while the right path is pretty good and would probably merit a ranking about 5 places higher on this list, the left path isn't and merits a ranking about 5 places lower. So overall, it's a mixed bag. Number 52. Shakespeare Cliff Shakespeare Cliff doesn't quite measure up to the rest of the levels from the Lost Artifact, but it's still a decent level. 
It takes place in the underground metro tunnels between the UK and France, and this sort of setting just doesn't really lend itself to the same level of imagination as the setting of the other Lost Artifact levels. In general, industrial settings in Tomb Raider tend to be a bit hit and miss for me. The opening area with the cliffs of Dover in the background does a nice job of setting the stage though. If there's one thing the Lost Artifact expansion never fails in, it's in its secret areas and Shakespeare Cliff is no exception. The final part of the level is set in a giant area in which the Hand of Rathmore's toxic goo somehow burned through the metro tracks. It's at the bottom of this pit we find my favorite secret area of all the games. After filling this pit with water, it's possible for Lara to swim to a strange pocket dimension deep within the underground. Dinosaurs are no strangers to the Tomb Raider games, but finding pterodactyls deep within this hidden dimension was completely unexpected when I first did so. Going to this location and fighting the pterodactyls is always a personal highlight for me whenever I play the Lost Artifact. So, overall, Shakespeare Cliff is alright in my book. Number 51 Temple of Puna The South Pacific section of Tomb Raider 3 is one of the series' most difficult stretches of combat, platforming, puzzle solving, you name it. Temple of Puna, the fourth and final level in this section, takes all these challenges and crams them into a difficult gauntlet with little breathing room in between trials. Besides dodging venomous darts from the Polynesian tribesmen in the opening area, the rolling blades from Tomb Raider 2 return, Lara must press four buttons and avoid being sliced by these blades at the same time. This is followed by a super stressful trap in which Lara must pull three switches in rapid succession in order to open the door so she can escape before being crushed by a lowering spike ceiling. <sighs> and <laughs> that's still not it. The gauntlet is still on, there's one final trial for Lara to pass, or should I say, outrun? What have I got? The level ends in a showdown with the final boss of the South Pacific section. He uses the Aura Dagger artifact to attack Lara with electric jolts that will instantly kill her, while also summoning reptiles with severe cases of lethalitosis. Oh, and there's also a bottomless pit beneath the arena. Temple of Puna is not an easy time, but it is a fun time, and I encourage all players to try and clear it without failing any of the trials, as it feels super rewarding to do so. Number 50. The Hive. Following Atlantean Stronghold's massive and confusing level design, the Hive is more straightforward and enjoyable to play through. There are a lot of very unique looking areas in this level, and I prefer this level's primarily volcanic look over the grotesque look of Atlantean Stronghold. The Hive does not cut back on combat, however, but it manages to make the combat a bit more exciting. Lara has some epic encounters against the Atlantean creatures that often take place in exciting locations. I especially enjoy an encounter towards the end of the level where Lara enters an ominous chamber with several dormant creatures. You just know that these creatures will come to life though, so the calm before the storm should be spent preparing a strategy. Picking off these creatures one by one is very satisfactory, but it's also very difficult. Overall, the Hive ends the unfinished business expansion in a fine way, even if the Atlantean levels aren't nearly as good as the Egyptian ones. But more on those later. Number 49. Reunion. Reunion is the final level of the Lost Artifact, so in true Tomb Raider fashion, it brings us face to face with a final boss. So, who is the boss? Well, apparently Miss Lay did not die when Laura electrocuted her in London, so she's back more evil than ever. In the levels leading up to this, the player has been experiencing more of a gruesome experiment, so there's even more motivation for the player to kill her this time. She is definitely worth killing twice. While the fight against Miss Lay itself isn't as interesting as it was in City, the rest of the level is superior. It has an incredible visual presentation with atmospheric lightning that makes you think of Dario Argento's Suspiria. Reunion takes place in a twisted version of the previous level, as if a portal to hell has been opened. The walls are decorated with bones, warped faces and human flesh. Once Lara is done killing Miss Lay, for good this time, a hot air balloon arrives to pick her up, which is a fun way to say a final goodbye to Tomb Raider 3. Did Winston grow a beard? Number 48. 
Floating Islands. Floating Islands is perhaps the most unique looking Tomb Raider level of all time. The level is supposedly inspired by Mang Peng Lai from Chinese mythology as well as the quartzite sandstone pillars of Wuling Yan which resemble floating islands when engulfed by fog. While plenty of Tomb Raider levels deal with a supernatural element or other fantastical occurrences, Floating Islands is the only level that takes place entirely within an otherworldly setting. But while the level has a unique look and a great atmosphere, I'm not entirely on board with it. I prefer realistic locations in Tomb Raider as opposed to supernatural ones, so Floating Islands takes it a bit too far in my opinion. It's also a very difficult level, but not in a good way. There is way too many combat encounters in this level and they absolutely kill the flow of it. I've previously complained about the amount of combat we are put through in Tomb Raider 2, but this is where it gets too much for me. The supernatural guardians of floating islands are bullet sponges that take forever to kill, and they deal a lot of damage and can instantly kill Lara. The level looks amazing, sure, but it's just too frustrating. Number 47 Aldwich Aw, oh, Aldwich, I want to love you, but you make it so difficult for me. Before I get into that, let me talk about the things I do love about it. Aldwich is based on an abandoned subway station in London, which adds a layer of authenticity to the level. Exploring this place is genuinely spooky, and while Aldwich only closed four years before the events of Tomb Raider 3, it feels like humanity abandoned it much earlier. The place is infested with a nail bat wielding gang of thugs called the Damned. And since we are in an underground subway station, there's a new danger for Lara to watch out for. Rapid dogs. In general, this level just has a feeling of danger that feels more realistic than the usual dangers Lara goes up against. The atmosphere is top notch in Aldwych and the level designer did an excellent job of setting the mood. A personal highlight of mine is uncovering the Freemason's Temple deep within the underground tunnels. Unfortunately, I always find Aldwych a bit of a chore to play through. It has that same style of non-linear and confusing level design as The Deck and The Cistern, where lots of backtracking and getting lost is to be endured constantly. A lot of areas in the level look almost identical too, which makes sense due to the theme of the level, but it isn't very fun when you need to navigate it. There are also some truly, well, puzzling puzzles in this level, like using a coin that only works in one specific ticket booth. Aldwych gets some things very right and I can certainly appreciate it. It's a very challenging level, which in theory is a good thing, but when most of the challenge lies in making sense of the level's confusing structure, it's mostly a recipe for frustration. There is some enjoyment to be had though. Number 46 Venice Oh, sorry, I was, uh, I was just enjoying the music there. Venice is excellently adapted into a level in Tomb Raider 2 as the atmosphere and look of the city is spot on. Well, it is an unusually desolate take on Venice without hordes of tourists and instead it has hordes of the series' first ever non-boss human enemies. It's also the first time in the series that the player gets to control a vehicle with most of the gameplay taking place in a motorboat. Unfortunately, Lara can't defend herself while in the motorboat, which means the player will often take damage from gunfire that can't be avoided. This gets frustrating very quickly and the player will end up abusing numerous med packs. To complete the level, Lara needs to first sacrifice her motorboat to clear the water mines in front of the exit. The player must then reach the exit in a different boat, but only has very limited time to do so. This race to the finish is an incredibly satisfying ending to a level that ultimately feels a bit awkward due to its gimmick. Number 45 Tomb of Tihogan Tomb of Tihogan is a direct continuation of the sister, not just in terms of chronological level order, but also in terms of aesthetics. It plays entirely different than the sister, however. 
Tomb of Tihokan is a linear and straightforward experience, which is very welcome after the cistern. The level designer really nails the feeling of exploring something that has been left forgotten for ages, as Lara is deep beneath the folly she entered levels earlier. The level introduces the series' first otherworldly creature for Lara to fight against as an Atlantean centaur comes to life from its previous statue form. This marks a turning point in the series from which it opens its doors to the supernatural for the first time. The best thing about Tomb of Tihogan, however, is that Lara finally gets to kill that asshole Pierre Dupont. I haven't talked about Pierre until now, but he is a rival Tomb Raider who has been ambushing Lara with gunfire throughout the entire Grease section. He's been shooting, running and hiding all this time, but this time, he dies. A truly satisfactory ending to a rock solid level. Number 44. Caves of Kalia. The Caves of Kalia is a dark maze with an occasional boulder trap, some more fair than others. Finding your way through this double-tiered maze is no easy task, especially since some of the corridors you need to navigate are hidden behind pushable blocks. Eventually you'll make your way to a mysterious dark pit in the middle of the floor, and after weighing in your options, you'll come to the conclusion that the only thing you can do is drop into the hole. You'll then realize you've jumped into a pit full of cobras in every single direction and it's the most terrifying thing ever! So your instinct is to get the f*** uh -huh. out of there as quickly as possible, but that will trigger a boulder, so you need to look out for that on top of dodging cobras. Thanks, game. I cannot stress enough how terrified this section made me as a kid. The level ends with an epic showdown against Tony the Loon. This wacko creeped me out as a kid with his ramblings about hearing voices and over-the-top behavior. He lights the oil pools in the chamber on fire, which means Lara needs to constantly watch her step as he fires fireballs at her. This level has some serious good standout moments, proving that even short levels can offer something valuable. Number 43. Bartoli's Hideout. Bartoli's Hideout takes Lara away from the public canals of Venice and into Bartoli's compound, which of course is full of mobsters. While the level's predecessor mainly tied exploration to the motorboat, this level is more of a traditional Tomb Raider experience, which means we get to explore Venice on foot instead. I prefer this, and Bartoli's hideout gives us several interesting locations to explore, like Venetian back alleys with lemon trees, a library, and the dark flooded basements beneath the compound. There are even booby trap corridors here, as if Bartoli expected Lara to break into his compound. A personal highlight of mine is the chandelier puzzle in which Lara must raise and lower a set of chandeliers to reach different parts of the room. Bartoli has seemingly fled to an abandoned opera house, which is blocked by a building. Does Lara need to take an entirely different route to get there? Nah, she just blows up that building instead for a bit of that classic Lara Croft subtlety. Number 42. City of Vilcabamba. The city of Vilcabamba has long been abandoned by humans and is now the home of a pack of wolves, bats and a giant bear. Unlike caves, you can't avoid this bear as it guards a room you need to enter. While caves was very linear and basically getting Lara from point A to B, City of Vilcabamba is more open and the design of the level encourages the player to explore the various surroundings. Several parts of the city aren't even required to visit in order to progress, which makes the level interesting to go back and replay. While the level is still primarily tied to a cave setting, the textures and general level design is more advanced here. The ink and artwork is gorgeous and really helps paint the mood of the level. The game begins to expect more of the player's platforming and combat abilities in this level, but it still feels like a fair and gradual step up in difficulty. Unfortunately, City of Vilcabamba comes across as more of a transitional area than an actual main focus of Lara's. It feels more like a setup to the next levels of the Peru section than a main event in itself. This hurts the level a little bit, but it works fine in between the game's opening level and the far more noteworthy third level. Number 41. Tim's Wharf. Tim's Wharf does an excellent job of setting the stage. It has a dark, cold and wet atmosphere to it, which works very well. This level does not hold your hand or give you any direction with its non-linear level design and intimidating verticality. There is a lot of tricky platforming in the first area of the level and a few enemy encounters. Eventually Lara will make it to some sort of sewer facility from where the level takes on a more puzzle-heavy direction. 
Essentially, Lara needs to play around with the water levels of the giant tanks to take her to different parts of the area. This can actually be a bit confusing, and in a way, the level comes across as a modern take on the cistern. It even has the giant rats. There is an enjoyable puzzle in the underground where you need to trick some sort of robotic thing into short-circuiting itself. Doing so will give Lara access to a new button for the water level puzzle. The level gets really interesting towards the end when Lara emerges at the top of the very cathedral you could see at the beginning of the level. Tim's Wharf ends with a brilliant cutscene that puts Lara on the track to take down Miss Sophia Lee. It's actually a pretty good level, but it never truly takes off. Number 40. Wreck of the Maria Doria. While this is not my favorite level of the shipwreck section, Wreck of the Maria Doria feels like the main event. Everything is upside down, which makes exploration very interesting. There's also an unsettling atmosphere of sadness in the level. It's just a pretty chilling experience to see things like the giant ballroom in its current state when trying to imagine what this ship looked like once upon a time. It's such a brilliant different take on a tomb, showing us that tombs don't necessarily need to be located in thousand-year-old temples or crypts in Egypt or Greece. The Maria Doria became the tomb for hundreds of passengers back when it sank in the early 20th century. The level is highly non-linear, but rather unusual in this style of level design as most of the level takes place within enclosed spaces connected by small corridors. Usually, the more non-linear Tomb Raider levels take place in big open areas where the player can sort of map out the place on their own. The player doesn't have this privilege here, which actually makes navigation very confusing and frustrating. To complete the level, Lara must swim through a series of narrow caves full of moray eels and barracudas trying to kill her. This is another one of those wonderful moments in the classic Tomb Raider games where I just kind of prefer to close my eyes and hope for the best. Number 39. It's a Madhouse. It's a Madhouse is an aptly titled crazy level towards the end of the Lost Artifact. It could have been titled Lara at the Sioux because a French Sioux has been adapted into a Tomb Raider death trap. Aesthetically, there's nothing like it, and I really enjoy exploring the various parts of the Sioux and the town it sits in. There are lots of parallels to draw to Nightmare in Vegas here, as they both are novelty levels, but the madness works here. This is one of the most entertaining Tomb Raider levels to explore, as it's so unusual to see Lara in this type of environment. This zoo houses hundreds of guests during daytime, but during nighttime, the animals, including tigers, are just allowed to run freely around, it seems. The level designer has found several unique ways to adapt typical zoo areas like an aviary or a monkey terrarium into Tomb Raider platforming challenges. At one point, a cheeky monkey will grab a key that Lara needs to make it out of there. There's just no way this monkey will give up the key, no matter how much Lara points her guns at it. Eventually, the player will get to the only conclusion there is to get to. <laughs> Who would have ever thought that a Sioux could work as a Tomb Raider level, but it does, and it's a classic example of that quirky out-of-the-box level design of the Tomb Raider expansions. Number 38. Tomb of Qualapec. Tomb of Qualapec is the first actual tomb in the series, and while it's a rather short level, it leaves quite an impression. I love how the camera positions itself behind the Scion once Lara makes her way towards the locked gate to the tomb. This is an excellent way of telling the player that this is your goal, and now you need to figure out how to get to it. The level has a striking visual identity that really sets it apart from the previous levels with its use of bright and clean colors. The pristine condition of the tomb stands in stark contrast to the dilapidated city of Ilkabamba and makes the place feel even more exclusive and hidden. This level is actually very important since Lara is doing her first actual tomb raiding in the series by stealing the first Scion piece. The Scion is ominously being watched by the skeleton of its long-deceased Atlantean owner as Lara enters the tomb. Grabbing the Scion causes the tomb to collapse, so Lara must quickly escape in order to survive. The level ends with a very brief boss fight against Lara's rival Nathan Drake, ah, I mean Larson. Larson kind of is like a Nathan Drake with brain damage though. KO! Number 37. Fool's Gold. 
The oddly titled Fool's Gold has Lara exploring an abandoned Soviet facility which by the looks of it could have been a gulag once upon a time. It almost feels as if a Wolfenstein 3D level designer made this level and just switched out Nazi imagery and Adolf Hitler portraits with Soviet imagery and Joseph Stalin portraits. It's another very combat heavy Tomb Raider 2 level, but I don't mind it this time around as the encounters usually take place in open areas. There's a good amount of variety in the enemies as well, like regular enemies, flamethrower enemies and even enemies attacking on a skidoo. This always keeps the combat fresh. Fool's Gold is an entertaining level to play through, but it really kicks into high gear towards the end. A glowing skeleton at the entrance of a giant cave is the first indicator that there's something strange about this place and that the Soviets probably were about to uncover something mysterious that wasn't meant to be found. Descending into the cave and discovering the ancient murals within it is a chilling moment and an excellent ending to a very strong level. Number 36 Antarctica Don't let the immediate beauty of Antarctica fool you, this level does not play around. The icy blue waters look so refreshing, but they are not safe for Lara as she will freeze to death if she stays in them for too long. Lara's goal is to get her hands on the motorboat at the front of the RX Explorer, which will take her further into the landscape to locate Willard's base. The base is scattered throughout a very large area and it's actually a pretty confusing area to explore because of how open and non-linear it is. The Antarctica section of Tomb Raider 3 is clearly influenced by John Carpenter's The Thing and this level in particular encapsulates that atmosphere of isolation, paranoia and terror. The level has an ominous silence to it with the squalls of the polar winds substituting any sort of background music. Lara is constantly jumped by Willard's guards and dogs which adds to the tension of the level. This is where the sprawling design of the level works as a danger in itself as it is sort of disorienting while attacks can come from anywhere. A disturbing discovery in a burned out part of the base however kind of solidifies that maybe Willard isn't to be trusted at all. Inside Lara finds a venom spewing mutated scientist which is a shocking and disturbing sight. Ultimately this serves as the Antarctica section's saving grace for me because while a bit confusing and backtracking heavy, this is a very good level. Number 35 Lara's Home Lara's Home is the lovable tutorial level of the first three games in the series, which I have decided to merge into one for the purpose of this ranking. The first iteration is really basic and serves solely as a place where the player can get acquainted with the game's jumping, vaulting and swimming mechanics. Tomb Raider 2's version adds an outdoor training facility where the player can improve their more advanced platforming abilities. Tomb Raider 2 also introduced actual puzzles for the player to solve in Lara's Home. Lara has a gigantic hedge maze in her garden, which will lead to a button that opens a timed door to the secret treasure vault. It's hilarious to see all the familiar items from the first game, which she apparently pillaged and put in her basement. More importantly, Tomb Raider 2 introduces Lara's butler Winston to her manor. He persistently follows Lara all over the place to serve her tea, but he should know better. There is not a single 90s kid out there who played Tomb Raider 2 and didn't lock Winston inside the walk-in freezer in Lara's kitchen. We all did it, we are all horrible, horrible people, and we all did it to him again in Tomb Raider 3. The Tomb Raider 3 version of Lara's home is unsurprisingly the peak version of it, taking the best of the previous versions on top of looking absolutely gorgeous. Lara's treasure vault has been moved to a different location and features artifacts from the previous games now, as well as a T-Rex mantle. There is also a far more elaborate puzzle to get inside the timed door room this time around, which has been changed into a large aquarium. Lara can take a swim in this aquarium to grab the key to the secret quad bike track. This is actually the best place in the game to ride the vehicle, where the player can practice and improve their time on the track. And it's also possible to do some target practicing on poor old Winston. How the hell did he get out of the freezer? Well, there's only one thing to do about that. Number 34 Home Sweet Home Home Sweet Home is a natural follow-up to Lara's home in this ranking as this level 2 takes place in her manor. As Lara admires the dagger of Xi'an before going to bed, the remnants of the Fiamma Nera pull up in vain to invade her home. 
This is actually super scary as Lara's home is enormous and the enemies can attack Lara from anywhere. There's no level that features as intense combat as this one, but dare I say that it's my favorite combat in the whole series? I adore this level so much and I think it's in part due to the fact that Croft Manor is included in the main story. Exploring Croft Manor at night is actually quite spooky as giant mansions typically tend to be. There is even an opportunity to check in on Winston, you know, just to see how he's doing. After having taken down numerous thugs, dogs and even a double shotgun wielding boss, Lara returns to her bathroom to disrobe and take a well-earned shower- Don't you think you've seen enough? Number 33. Opera House. An abandoned opera house is such a unique take on a Tomb Raider level since it takes Lara to a ruined version of something that had a function not too long ago. Unlike all the pyramids and temples of the first game, most people can relate to an opera house or a theater, which makes the experience feel more haunting somehow. This rundown, dilapidated Venetian opera house is kind of sad and it's interesting to wonder what happened to it. Besides Bartoli's thugs, this place is full of environmental dangers like broken glass, sandbags dropping from the ceiling and even swinging boxes which, I don't know, that's a bit too cartoonish for me. Throughout the entire level, Lara tries to figure out how to raise the backdrop on the stage so she can enter the warehouse behind it. Once she does, she is greeted by more thugs as well as the level's boss, a double shotgun wielding tall thug who deals a lot of damage. Opera House is a good level, helped a lot by its brilliant setting. It drags a bit towards the end though and the gloomy feel of the level gets a bit tiresome. It does a really good job though of using this particular environment convincingly as a Tomb Raider level. Number 32. Colosseum. Colosseum is not the most advanced Tomb Raider level in terms of gameplay as it's mainly centered around pulling switches and backtracking. What Colosseum does right, however, is atmosphere. The first time Lara arrives at the lookout over the entire arena, I'm covered in goosebumps. Imagine, this Colosseum was left forgotten thousands of years ago and it is still inhabited by all sorts of wild animals, whose ancestors fought against gladiators all those years ago. These animals have completely taken over this Colosseum as there are no traces of humans having been here for centuries. Well, except for that stalking no good piece of shit Pierre Dupont. The animals are also tied to my single biggest gripe with the level, however. Animals like gorillas and lions are on the brink of extinction in real life and... I don't particularly enjoy gunning down hordes of their polygon counterparts. I know that's silly, but ugh, I just cringe at killing dozens of these poor cute blocky animals. I'm okay with shooting Pierre though. Again, fuck him! Uh -huh. Besides that though, this is a very enjoyable level to play through. Number 31. Catacombs of the Talion. Catacombs of the Talion is, for the most part, a stellar Tomb Raider level that packs a couple of truly amazing moments and areas. It serves almost as a companion piece to Ice Palace with the two levels intertwining several times. Catacombs of the Talion is far more interesting though. The temple and surrounding caves are very pretty but there's an unsettling atmosphere as well due to an encounter with a scary yeti at the beginning of the level. For the remainder of your time here you just know that there will be more yetis eventually and this makes the level very tense to play through. In the scariest moment of the level and one of the scariest moments of the series you can hear angry yetis all around you within the pitch black darkness of the temple. This is frightening because you can't see the place properly and you feel like you might get attacked by a violent yeti at any moment. Luckily you are safe until you pull a lever, but at that point you better prepare yourself for a fight with a lot of them. Thankfully, the level also have less anxiety inducing moments like discovering a big underground lake which I thought was a very nice location. Unfortunately, the player also needs to kill dozens of snow leopards in this level. Christ, snow leopards are so critically endangered in real life that the amount Lara kills here pretty much equals the amount that's left in the wild. It's a relief when you finally get to kill humans again instead. And that probably got me on a list somewhere. Number 30. The Great Pyramid. The original Tomb Raider game throws everything at the player at the end. 
It's almost as if this is a final exam the player must pass in order to be able to say that they've beaten the original Tomb Raider. Following a claustrophobic boss fight against a giant mutant, Lara destroys the Scion, which causes the pyramid to self-destruct. This triggers the gauntlet of traps Lara must rapidly pass through in order to escape the pyramid. Pulling off this run of traps flawlessly without taking any damage or screwing anything up is an adrenaline rush unlike anything else in the game. This level is exhausting and exactly how a final level to a Tomb Raider game should be. None of the other games in the series ever got it as right as they did in the first one. The level culminates in another boss fight, this time against the evil witch herself, Jacqueline Natla. Unlike the boss in the opening area, Natla is super aggressive and fast. She also needs to be taken down twice before Lara can finally make her way out of there. Number 29. City of Hamun. City of Hamun suffers from being the player's earliest acquainting with the fantastic Egypt levels of the first game. While it is a stunning level with its use of the game's Egyptian colors and textures, all of the following levels surpass it in beauty, which leaves it a bit forgettable, from a visual standpoint at least. That leaves it with the gameplay and luckily City of Hamun does fairly well for itself in that department. The level has very good platforming sections and puzzles and is excellently paced. There are new enemies for the player to take on here like panthers and even mummies. Something that is pretty much exclusive to City of Hamun is the fact that it's the only level in this series where not just one, but two later levels in the game return to or reuse some of its areas. It's easy to understand why though, as City of Hamun has some very well designed and memorable areas. City of Hamun is a great introduction to the excellent Egypt levels, but is ultimately overshadowed a bit by all the other levels in this section of the game. Number 28. Return to Egypt Lara returns to the city of Hamun in the unfinished business expansion and the city has been flooded since the last time she visited. I wonder what caused such a thing to happen to this magnificent place. Who would do something like that? While Return to Egypt starts out rather uneventful as Lara is seemingly just back in an area she has already fully explored in the main game, the level picks up and does its own unique thing. It has that trademark expansion level creativeness to it as the level is themed around cats. The place is decorated with cat statues and mules and there are even giant paw prints in the sand which Lara can follow to advance in the level. Eventually this of course means that Lara must fight the owners of those paw prints, clearly just ignoring that cats are worshipped and probably sacred here. Cats are fun and so is this level. What a brilliant theme for a Tomb Raider level and it gets even better in the next one. Return to Egypt also sets itself apart from City of Hamun by having a beautiful starlit night sky. The first Tomb Raider game did not have any sky textures at all, so if you want to experience original Tomb Raider style levels with sky textures, this is where you can do it. Number 27. Sleeping with the Fishes. The Lost Artifact expansion does a dark turn in Sleeping with the Fishes, surprisingly taking on some rather serious and disturbing themes. The level is unique in the sense that it takes place almost entirely underwater. This means that exploration, puzzle solving and even combat takes place underwater with a few exceptions. And it makes it work. Lara is searching for the Hand of Rathmore artifact in the Strait of Dover where she has uncovered some secret facility that's operating from the depths. Before reaching the facility however, there's an incredible secret area to explore in one of the giant caves where the wreck of a World War II submarine has been entombed. The facility is owned by some evil corporation called Slink that seemingly tries to merge fish and humans. I'm not exactly sure what's going on here other than it's some uh -huh. f***ed up experiment that's powered by the artifact. Slink of course stands for Sophia Lay Inc, which makes sense considering one evil business she did in Tomb Raider 3. The horrifying revelations of encaged humans that have begun growing fish scales in their naked bodies serve as disturbing imagery before finishing the level. Meanwhile, giant mutant monster fish roam the waters outside the facility, begging the question, were these fish made from humans inside the lab? The level does an excellent job of building up to this shocking revelation as there's no way for the player to anticipate these horrors. It's nice then that the level ends with a heartwarming little moment where Lara helps a dolphin escape its prison cell, preventing it from being subjected to cruel experiments. 
It's nice when Lara can have interactions with animals that don't end in murder. Number 26. Barkang Monastery. Barkang Monastery is an absolutely stunning level with an almost meticulous attention to detail in its beautiful aesthetics. From a gameplay standpoint, this level is very complex and there are so many ways in which you can take it on. The task you have at hand is to collect 5 prayer wheels and these wheels are scattered all over the entire monastery, which is enormous. While not only being difficult to navigate, the monastery is, as per Tomb Raider tradition, of course filled with lots of traps to always keep you on your toes. Unfortunately, the level has a design flaw that keeps it from true greatness. As soon as Lara arrives at the monastery at the beginning of the level, you witness the Bakang monks fighting with Bartoli's thugs. While the monks generally do pretty well for themselves, you may risk that the thugs gun them down, which you don't want to happen. So you want to help them, right? Well, unfortunately, this is where Tomb Raider's auto-targeting becomes a big problem, as there's no distinction between enemies and allies. It's pretty much impossible to avoid firing at your Bakang allies if you want to help them take out the thugs, which of course you do. This means that you quickly can end up in a situation where the monks start attacking you because you've accidentally fired your bullets at them. Or maybe these monks just don't like Lara. They might have a problem with the amount of dead animals that seem to pile up in her trail wherever she goes. I can't imagine that sits well with these Buddhist monks. Or maybe these monks have just been living in isolation for a bit too long. Number 25. Tibetan Foothills. Tibetan Foothills starts out deceptively slow as Lara has a mostly peaceful little hike in the foothills. There's a beautiful canyon that the player must reach the other side of and Lara passes through various caves and mountain paths to do so. The level does a 180 however and becomes one of the craziest and most action-packed levels of the series once Lara gets her hands on the infamous Skidoo. Tibetan Foothills is the perfect Tomb Raider vehicle level as the level clearly is designed with the Skidoo in mind. Even the puzzles and platforming of the level require using the vehicle. The Skidoo doesn't control perfectly but that adds to the craziness of the level in a good way. The keyword here is fun. Tibetan Foothills is an absolute blast to play and probably the best designed level from an action gameplay standpoint. And that Skidoo theme is just such a killer. Number 24. Atlantis. Atlantis is one long endurance test near the end of the first Tomb Raider game. Lara must reach and destroy the Scion at the top of the pyramid, but she begins the level way down in the dungeons. The level has a simple structure that is perfectly executed, where Lara consistently returns to the pyramid's central chamber following the successful survival of one of the level's dangerous trials. Each time Lara returns to this chamber, the player can see how much closer they've come to the platform at the top of the chamber since the last time. This is a brilliant way of incorporating the level's vertical design into progress tracking as well as suspense building. All of the trials of the level are satisfying to complete and they all take on different gameplay mechanics. While some of the trials are based in platforming or combat challenges, my favorite trials are the ones based in puzzle solving. Atlantis presents the game's arguably most advanced puzzles. The unforgettable doppelganger puzzle is the highlight of the level for me. The doppelganger mirrors Lara's every move, but it needs to be eliminated before Lara can leave the room and advance. And no, shooting it won't work. Instead, Lara must trick the doppelganger to fall through a trapdoor that only exists in one side of the room. This is a brilliant puzzle in an overall brilliant level where the only real shortcoming is my distaste for its visual presentation. Number 23. Living Quarters. The Maria Doria shipwreck section reaches its peak in the excellent Living Quarters level. At first, the player is just given more of the usual rusty engine surroundings to explore, but this changes. 
After swimming to the broken off part of the ship, the part that isn't upside down, Lara gets to explore what's basically a haunted house at the bottom of the sea. These crooked hallways are decorated with old paintings and candle holders, making it feel like you're exploring an old creepy mansion that is haunted by ghosts. There are no ghosts here though, just more of Bartoli's thugs. Even they have reached this part of the wreck somehow. The dilapidated theater of the Maria Doria is the crown jewel of this creepy exploration of the shipwreck. While this place certainly is creepy, it's not what makes this level downright scary. Of course there's a giant ugly monster eel in the cave to scare the shit out of me and ruin my childhood. I was just an innocent kid having a good time with a video game. Why? Why? No. Number 22. Coastal Village. I don't care what anybody says about old school Tomb Raider graphics. The opening of Coastal Village is absolutely stunning. As you wash ashore on the beach, you are met with palm trees, waterfalls, colorful streams of fish, and a beautiful sunrise. But that's where the tranquility ends, as this island is spooky and dangerous. The player must choose between two very different paths that will take Lara to the titular village. The forest path is rather straightforward, but requires of Lara to gather three serpent stones, which are scattered all over the temple grounds. Delivering the serpent stones will unlock the upper part of the village. The cave path cannot be accessed before Lara has picked up a key from the coral reefs, which Lara must use to open a trapdoor inside a hut. Lara must then navigate a rather difficult platforming section through a cave, which will take her to the lower part of the village. No matter what path the player chooses, Lara will find her way to a very inhospitable village. The village induces a real sense of paranoia in the player due to the constant ambushes from out of nowhere, and it works incredibly well as a tense contrast to the level's tropical setting. Coastal Village is a great example of how non-linear level design can work perfectly by giving the player two choices that are equally exciting, all the while giving the player a stunning level to explore. The only real downside to the level is that the village itself isn't as exciting to explore as it was to get there. Number 21. Temple of the Cat. The charming atmosphere of Return to Egypt bulks up on steroids and Temple of the Cat as this level goes all in on the cat theme. It's a far more challenging level too and in hindsight Return to Egypt was pretty much just a prelude to the real thing. This is one of those marathon like Tomb Raider levels that take Lara on a long journey. Luckily this level is a blast to explore and it never becomes stale as it always mixes things up at the right moment. It has the usual stunning Egyptian textures and even adds in some new ones, including these running cats which hilariously made me double take when I played through it. For a while, it even becomes the temple of the crocodile. Gameplay wise, it doesn't do anything new, but the main Tomb Raider game didn't have any levels as massive as this, so in that sense it's very different. A giant cat sphinx serves as the final set piece of the level. Whoever built this temple thousands of years ago must have really liked cats. To complete the level, Lara must extend the cat's tongue so she can drop into its mouth and exit the level. I'm not kitten. That's just perfect level design. Number 20. Crash Side. Crash Side is crazy. After crossing a devious swamp with the help of a map, Lara enters the inner jungles of the island. But again, the tranquility is deceitful. Here she finds a wrecked military plane and its survivors defending themselves against raptors. This is Tomb Raider 3's dinosaur level and sadly the last one in the series, but oh boy does it make up for it. The crash site works like a hub area with smaller areas branching out from it which the player can take on in any order. Besides raptors and cute little flesh eating dinosaurs, there's of course a T-Rex and easily the most difficult T-Rex encounter in all the games. Crash Side is exhausting to play through and I love it. The combat encounters are plentiful, but exciting and challenging in a good way. At one point, Lara needs to pull a lever in a piranha pool, which needless to say isn't going to end well. Instead, she needs to divert the piranha's attention to a raptor carcass that's hanging from the canopy, which will make it possible for her to drop into the pool and pull the lever without being eaten alive. This is easily one of my favorite puzzles in the entire series. 
And when you think you've seen everything this level has to offer, it kicks into an even higher gear. Locating two keys gives Lara access to a cannon with which she can blow up the remaining raptors, as well as the temple in the mountains for good measure. I think it's safe to say that we are officially in Masterpiece territory now. Number 19. St. Francis Folly. St. Francis Folly takes Meteora in Greece and makes it a great Tomb Raider level. It's the first level in the series to use a main area from which Lara must gather items in side rooms. This main area has an almost surreal architecture that makes it difficult to navigate. Lara must collect keys in trial rooms that are based on heroes and gods of Greek mythology. What? Never heard of Thor, the Greek god of war? Thor's trial room is primarily based around Thor's hammer Mjölna, which Lara must trigger and dodge to gain access to the key. This is probably my favorite of the four trials. Damocles' mythological sword is used brilliantly in his trial room, where it drops from the ceiling and kills Lara instantly if the player rushes through the room after having grabbed the key. Atlas' trial room is a game of chicken with a boulder, which is based on our planet since, you know, Atlas supposedly carries the world on his back. And someone at Cordesign clearly needs to do their homework on Greek mythology since Poseidon is mistakenly called Neptune here, his name in Roman mythology. His trial, of course, is a swimming puzzle. The player can take on these four trials in whichever order they like. Besides a couple of embarrassing hiccups, this level is simply one of the all-time best Tomb Raider levels. Number 18. Highland Fling. The peculiarly titled Highland Fling is a perfect opening level of Tomb Raider 3's Lost Artifact expansion. Lara is infiltrating Dr. Willard's private castle to search for a lost meteorite artifact he stores somewhere in his keep. Despite all the exotic locations of past Tomb Raider levels, Scotland of all places might be one of the most beautiful places Lara has traveled to in any of the games. We are given a very pretty castle to explore with a lot of brand new textures and an engaging atmosphere. Highland Fling doesn't really do anything new in terms of gameplay and is clearly just designed to let the player explore and enjoy the beautiful surroundings. The myth of the Loch Ness Monster is charmingly built into the level with a couple of possible Nessie sightings if the player pays attention. These sightings work as more than easter eggs however as they sort of build up to the level's incredible secret area. You see, if the player manages to locate the secret area, Lara will eventually stand face to face with a fire-breathing Nessie. However, it's not the real Nessie. It's just a weird submarine thing Willard has had constructed for him, perhaps to scare away potential artifact thieves. This secret is absolutely fabulous. What a great idea and what a fun way for the level designer to play into the discourse of the legitimacy of the Loch Ness Monster. It's possible to complete the level without experiencing any of the Nessie stuff, which tells you something about the great lengths the level goes to to reward exploration. It actually bothers me to think about all the Tomb Raider fans out there who never have and perhaps never will play this level due to the difficulty of tracking down the lost artifact. If you've never played this expansion, make it your top priority to do so. Number 17. Willard's Lair. Where Highland Fling was a rather easygoing exploration based level, Willard's Lair is an exhilarating gauntlet of death traps from start to finish, pretty much. A lot of these traps are very unpredictable, and so the level lends itself to a trial and error way of progression. Trial and error gameplay isn't typically a good thing in my opinion, but the level's unpredictability is also a big part of its charm. The sudden deaths don't feel as infuriating as they feel like cheeky little gutchas the level throws at you. There is a devious boulder trap early in the level that I doubt anyone has ever cleared first try. <sighs> when Lara finally reaches the safe with the lost Hand of Wrathmore artifact, she discovers that it has been stolen and from this point on, all we do for the rest of the expansion is following its tracks. In true lost artifact fashion, the level peaks for me in its brilliant final secret, where Lara gets the chance to gun down several mysterious Highlanders. These Highlanders lurk in a hidden meadow within Willard's castle, which is a stunning location for such an epic battle. What can I say? This level is awesome. Number 16. Obelisk of Hamun. Obelisk of Hamun takes the concept of Saint Francis Folly and puts it in the most stunning level of the original Tomb Raider game. This level is downright beautiful and exploring it is such a pleasure. There's simply an abundance of stunning artwork throughout the entire level, and for an Egyptophile like me, 
That's a recipe for spending a long time in the level. Laura must extend a bridge to each side of the obelisk's four sides in order to pick up four unique objects that must be used in the city of Hamun. This means that the player very early on knows exactly what they must do, but not necessarily how to do it. This is a very complex level to navigate, as you'd expect from a place that's thousands of years old, and it has a lot of areas to explore. What impresses me the most is how the level keeps getting better and better the more you explore it. Every single area gives the player an exciting task, and the level feels almost like a Rubik's Cube that just always changes and gives the player new challenges. At one point in the level, Lara must alter the architecture of the room itself in order to reach the area she needs to reach in order to advance. Obelisk of Hamun is pretty much a perfect level, but there is one Egyptian level I actually like more. Number 15. Area 51. The idea that industrial settings don't work in Tomb Raider is completely obliterated by Tomb Raider 3's fantastic Area 51 level. The level builds upon the stealth gameplay that was introduced in the previous level as being spotted by guards will make further progression more difficult, unless the player manages to kill them before they can activate the security systems. There is a wonderful sense of infiltrating a place you really aren't supposed to infiltrate with all sorts of advanced traps like lasers and turrets having replaced the usual spike and boulder hazards. Let's be honest, Lara has done multiple morally questionable actions on her many adventures, but I think her worst offense takes place here in Area 51. Lara justifies launching a missile simply to gain access to a certain platform. The missile might wipe out Las Vegas or Reno or wherever, but damn it, she needs to reach that platform because... reasons. Once again, a Tomb Raider level masterfully incorporates a popular myth into gameplay as Lara finds a UFO levitating in the hangar. In a nearby room, a deceased grey alien has been autopsied, adding another entirely different perspective on the whole tomb aspect of the series. The artifact Lara is looking for powers the UFO, so she needs to go inside it to retrieve it. The UFO employs the series only dimensional transcendental level design, which is pretty cool. Nevada is unusual in the sense that there is no final boss in the section, and I kind of wish Lara would have squared off against someone or something within the UFO. Still, it's hard to complain about anything when the level is as great as Area 51 is. Number 14. Sanctuary of the Scion Sanctuary of the Scion is peak Tomb Raider Egypt. While the level isn't as pretty as Obelisk of Hamun, it more than makes up for it by featuring an iconic Tomb Raider landmark. Inside a massive cave is a giant sphinx carved from the stone showcasing grandeur. This site is kind of intimidating, yet awe-inspiring. The level takes place almost entirely within this cave, so the Sphinx is always there in the background, watching Lara as she jumps and climbs around the rocks. It's not often the games feature a level so reliant on the platforming aspect of the gameplay as this one. Some of the platforming is downright vertigo-inducing due to how high up in the air the climbing takes place. Once Lara makes it inside the Sphinx, the player is introduced to another large impressive chamber. Eventually, this will take the player back to the start of the level on the other side of a locked gate, meaning that the goal was there all along. The level concludes with another showdown against Larson and a chance to take him out again. Permanently this time. This level is so brilliantly designed that it's hard to find anything critical to say about it. Number 13. Lutz Gate. Lutz Gate might be the most divisive Tomb Raider level of all time. The level has achieved infamy because of a brutally difficult underwater maze that left gamers on PlayStation in particular ripping out their hairs in frustration. I don't think I need to explain why an underwater maze is frustrating, but I'll elaborate anyway. While PC players were privileged with limitless game saves as well as adjustable gamma, the PlayStation players weren't. The underwater maze might be the single most difficult Tomb Raider challenge ever, so I understand why the level isn't universally loved. But personally, I adore Lutz Gate. Exploring the remnants of old London beneath modern London is as exciting as it sounds. The level also tells a great narrative as Lara joins forces with the leader of the Damned. He promises to help Lara reach Miss Sophia Lay if she'll steal some embalming fluid for his rotting flesh from the National Museum. I suppose he doesn't know about all the murders Lara just committed against his gang in Aldwych. It's completely optional if you help him or not, as you'll reach a goal either way. 
Helping him is so much more rewarding though, as it takes Laura to an incredible homage to the Sanctuary of the Scion that Laura would have missed had she gone into business for herself. In general, the entire Egyptian exhibition of the museum is such a brilliant way for the level designer to bring Tomb Raider's arguably most iconic location into a game that doesn't even feature levels in Egypt. One of the things that makes Ludsgate stand out is the way it doesn't follow any rulebook. Ludsgate packs an entire section's worth of level variety into one level and it pays off. This is one of Lara's greatest adventures. Number 12. Furnace of the Gods. Up until this point, the Golden Mask expansion has heavily featured exploration of industrial settings with an emphasis on combat gameplay. This changes in Furnace of the Gods, which takes Lara on one of her greatest adventures into the unknown. Lara explores a forgotten city made of gold, which is situated at the confluence of rivers of literal melted gold. I think I understand why this place has been kept a secret. The mysterious residents of the city magically come to life and Lara must help them defend it from thugs to keep it a secret. There is no other level in this series that looks like Furnace of the Gods, which has a completely unique visual identity. The level has such an impressive presence with its use of blue for the caves contrasting the orange and yellow hues of the city and rivers. It's a stunning level that not only excels visually but in its gameplay as well. The level never sticks to one path and takes the player through a series of interesting locations while also being a fair bit challenging. It's a level I had never played until I decided to do this ranking and I'm flabbergasted that a hidden gem like this had evaded me for so many years. The expansions tend to be overlooked and forgotten due to their relative obscurity as well as the difficulty of tracking them down these days. The effort is definitely worth it though as they have so many good levels. Number 11. The Great Wall The Great Wall is one of the best pranks ever played by a level designer on a gamer. The level opens Tomb Raider 2, one of the most anticipated games of all time back in 1997, and does none of what you would expect it to do as an opening level. Where the opening level of the first Tomb Raider game held your hand while teaching you how to play the game, The Great Wall doesn't give a shit about any of that and just tells you to get good instead. Imagine all of the young people who became Tomb Raider fans in 1996 basically being given the Great Pyramid as the opening level here. Or newcomers who never tried the first game but wanted to get into the franchise based on all the hype and this is their first experience with the series. I love this level of course as the gotcha on the unsuspecting player is masterfully cruel but hilarious nonetheless. It's actually a brilliant idea to open the game like this as the next several levels are more grounded and straightforward until the game starts going crazy again towards the end. The cherry on this Sunday of insanity is not just one, but two T-Rexes hanging out at the bottom of a cave. That's entirely optional to explore. Is there really anything to not love about the Great Wall? Seriously. Number 10. Palace Midas. Palace Midas is one of the most iconic Tomb Raider levels. It is constructed in an ingenious way, where Lara frequently returns to previous rooms from different vantage points, adding a rather complex layer of exploration to the level. I think the amount of combat Palasmidas throws at you gets tedious, but it's the only real downside to a level that's just, pardon the pun, golden. The level is a more refined version of St. Francis Folly, with Lara completing challenging quests to collect lead bars instead of keys this time around. At first, it isn't clear to the player what the purpose of these lead bars are, but if you're well versed in Greek mythology, the title of the level is the only hint you need. King Midas, of course, was an ancient Greek king who supposedly had the ability to turn whatever he touched into gold, which of course ended up as a curse more than a blessing for him. At one point in the level, Lara comes across a giant hand that has broken off the statue of the king. Lara needs the touch of the hand to turn the lead bars into gold so she can escape the palace. The level designer has done an amazing job here of converting an ancient myth into gameplay. But what happens if Lara jumps into the hand? <coughs> Number 9. Nevada Desert. Nevada Desert is a study in atmosphere and pacing. The level starts out somewhere in the desert near Area 51 and Lara needs to figure out how she can reach the mysterious military base and locate the Element 115 artifact. 
The ambience of the desert works perfectly in setting the mood, but the occasional appearances of stealth aircraft tells the player that they shouldn't take this piece and quiet for granted. The player is tasked with traversing a giant canyon before reaching a detonator that's hooked up to a large TNT box in a cave. So there's the player's objective. Laura needs to look for a key to the detonator so she can return and blow up the cave to get on her way. This takes Laura to some sort of facility that's being run by a gang of bikers. Laura needs to gain access to the quad bike in order to jump over the fence that's meant to keep intruders out of Area 51's grounds. But the facility is protected by an electrical fence, so Lara needs to find some other way inside. Nevada Desert is one of my favorite levels, not just because of its brilliant atmosphere and immersive narrative, but because it offers some of the series' most exciting exploration. While the level doesn't take Lara to a typical awe-inspiring ancient temple or anything like that, it still manages to transfer the same level of mystery and immersion to this modern-day setting. And it has a great ending. Number 8. Jungle Jungle is a perfect opening level. The serene jungle surroundings are gorgeous, especially with the game's dynamic weather. And the music? The atmosphere is deceptively calm though, as this is a pretty difficult level. It's not as insanely hard as the Great Wall is, but it's still quite challenging for an opening level. How many first-time players died on that opening mudslide, I wonder? Well, I did. This jungle has multiple ways to kill the player and works perfectly as an introduction to Tomb Raider 3's notable difficulty spike. It does a great job of preparing the player for this change of style. Almost at the beginning of the level you can see your goal, which you'll only realize when you reach it later. And if you try to reach it earlier, well, even that will kill you. The only thing that won't kill you in this jungle are the monkeys, but they will run away with med packs and even keys if you aren't quick enough. Jungle is my go-to level if I just need a quick Tomb Raider fix. The level is masterfully balanced in all aspects of gameplay. It just perfectly encapsulates the spirit of Tomb Raider 3. Non-linear level design with multiple paths to reach the goal, always soaked in beautiful graphics, lightning and music to deceive you into thinking you're safe. But in Tomb Raider 3, you're never safe. Number 7. High Security Compound High Security Compound is Tomb Raider 3's version of a no weapons level and it's excellent. Lara is immediately in danger as she can't protect herself from the abusive prison guards. Instead, the player must release other prisoners from their cells to do Lara's dirty work. It's hard to believe that Lara couldn't kick these guards' asses herself though, but it's such a fun mechanic that I'll just play along. For almost the entire level, Lara is vulnerable and needs to sneak around the compound without being spotted. If she gets spotted, the only way she can survive is to lure the guard into an ambush of prisoners. At one point in the level, Lara must sneak past the guard to use the facility's own laser trap against him. There's such a unique atmosphere to this level and the sense of infiltration is perfectly pulled off here. I adore this level and how differently it must be played from all other Tomb Raider levels, which is exactly the point with a gimmick like this. When Lara finally gets her pistols back, she is also gifted a potent Desert Eagle, which is my favorite weapon in the series. Finally being able to fight back against the personnel with a weapon as powerful as the Desert Eagle is such a great moment of empowerment. And it's set to the most epic piece of Tomb Raider 3's soundtrack. <laughs> Cheers, Lara. Number 6. Natlas Mines Natlas Mines is the first Tomb Raider game's version of the No Weapons level and it's the best one in my opinion. Lara has been left in the gutter by Natla with her artifacts and weapons stolen and she needs to figure out how to get it all back and take her revenge. Since Lara can't defend herself, the player needs to be really careful when collecting the fuses required to gain access to Lara's weapons. When she finally does get her pistols back, it's time to take on Natlas' three henchmen who serve as sub-bosses of the level. First up is the cowboy who guarded over one of the fuses and who the player was defenseless against earlier. Once he's down, Lara gets her magnum pistols back. Up next is the skateboard kid who randomly has his own skater park built down here in the dungeons of Atlantis. He's fast and can be difficult to damage. Once he's down, Lara gets her Uzis back.
finally there's the big bad Baldy who deals a lot of damage with his shotgun. Once he's down, Lara gets her shotgun back. The level just tells such an amazing narrative with nothing but its gameplay. Coming right after Egypt however, this is a pretty damn ugly level but that's how it's supposed to be. Lara is the underdog here and she needs to get back on top. Number 5 Kingdom For all these years I had no idea that one of my favorite Tomb Raider levels was just sitting there in an elusive Tomb Raider 2 expansion waiting for me to finally play it someday. This year I finally did. It's hard to believe that anything could surpass the splendid furnace of the gods level within a tiny expansion that equals the duration of a main game section. But then Kingdom exists. This level simply takes Lara on an amazing adventure. Immediately the setting of the level is perplexing as Lara seemingly has traveled back in time where human-like giant apes roam around. There is no time traveling involved though, Lara has simply just found her way to an ancient cloud forest in the mountains which houses a temple made of gold. While the previous level's use of blue worked perfectly opposite the golden hues of the city, Kingdom's use of green does an equally amazing job. As Lara emerges at the top of the canopy with a breathtaking view of the mountains, I'm just floored. This level is so damn beautiful. And it's not just that. From a gameplay standpoint, there's a lot of variety. There's a tricky switch puzzle within a maze of cages, there's some sort of battle arena for combat, and there's the series' probably hardest secret area. From Nightmare in Vegas to Kingdom, Tomb Raider 2's Golden Mask expansion certainly has this ranking covered from top to bottom. Number 4 Temple Ruins There is something spooky in that jungle indeed. Temple Ruins is quintessential Tomb Raider. It's a level that employs all of the tropes that are to be expected from classic Tomb Raider games. Uncovering ancient temple runes hidden away within the Indian jungle is a great start. Then there's the way the temple runes task the player with some of the series most difficult platforming and combat, like the menacing Shiva statues that come to life. These statues are very difficult to take out as they shield themselves from Lara's gunfire with their numerous sabers. The player needs to trick them into lowering their guard or attack them from behind in order to do any damage to them. Besides the usual environmental hazards like spikes and boulders, Temple Ruins is also equipped with a couple of time traps that require pitch perfect performance to clear. On top of all that, there's the usual faunal dangers like Indian piranhas as well as the friendly monkeys from the previous level not being so friendly any longer. For whatever reason. But worst of all, the venomous cobras. I'm terrified of snakes and while I've learned to react more mature to them as I've gotten older, the fear of the cobras that I had while playing as a kid still plays a big part in the tension I experience in this level. Temple Ruins is incredibly immersive, well constructed and fun to play. At times it's non-linear too and overall it's equal to the last levels of the previous game in terms of difficulty. And it's only the second level of the game. It's a great level to use as an introduction for newcomers to the classic games due to how greatly it embodies everything that is associated with old school Tomb Raider. They would get their asses handed to them over and over again, sure. But that's just how classic Tomb Raider rolls. Number 3 Lost Valley Lost Valley is Tomb Raider. There is no better way to say it. While the level has a very basic premise of simply collecting three cocks to advance to the next level, it's what it does with this premise that's amazing. At this point the player has seen nothing but cave settings in the game and Lost Valley is seemingly more of the same. That's just until Lara does a certain right turn and at that moment Tomb Raider is made. Put yourself in the shoes of someone experiencing Tomb Raider for the first time back in 1996 and suddenly finding themselves face to face with raptors and a T-Rex. This essentially let the player know that anything can happen in Tomb Raider. Lara's battle against the dinosaurs is downright epic and serves as such a brilliant twist in the game. I'm confident in calling this Tomb Raider's most iconic moment. Exploring the little nooks and crannies around the valley is great and it's remarkable how open the level design is for such an early level in the series. Lost Valley is a trailblazer in 3D level design and should be celebrated as such.
Even the opening area with the river passing through the cave has lots of little secrets everywhere for the player to explore. Lara must return to this area to put the cox in place, which will reveal the tomb of Qualopix's hidden entrance behind the waterfall. I truly believe that Lost Valley is a perfect Tomb Raider level that has everything you could possibly ask for. And despite being one of the shorter levels, it has a lot of replayability. Number 2 Temple of Xi'an In what must be considered a near-traumatizing moment in Tomb Raider 2, the player loses all of their progress in an instant, literally seconds before finally grabbing the Dagger of Xi'an. Not only did Lara not break into the temple when she had the chance at the beginning of the game, but after having done her homework on the Dagger of Xi'an, she is still left to rot in the dungeons beneath the temple due to a little mistake. As Lara slides further and further away from her goal and deeper and deeper into the dungeons beneath the temple, you just know you have a lot of hard work cut out for you. And that's putting it mildly. This level throws everything in your way, constantly testing your reflexes and timing as well as your platforming abilities with some of the most advanced trap design of the series. Temple of Xi'an is the granddaddy of them all, the level that separates the women from the girls, the men from the boys and the hardcores from the casuals. There are very few gaming achievements as satisfying as conquering every single challenge this level throws at you. The difficulty is incremental throughout the entire adventure, but never unfair. It's such an anomaly for Tomb Raider 2 as well. Don't get me wrong, I love Tomb Raider 2, but it's a more by the numbers action game experience than the other two games in the trilogy. If I'm being completely objective, Temple of Xi'an might be the best ever Tomb Raider level. It does everything absolutely perfectly. The narrative is woven so greatly into the structure of the level itself. The player is left infuriated after being fooled by a freaking trapdoor at the beginning of the level, but this is what fuels the motivation you need to succeed. The level design is rich and varied and the gameplay never gets stale and keeps you challenged with all sorts of twists and turns. The level just never goes easy on the player. Around the halfway point of the level, in between the series most difficult traps, there's a spooky cave with giant spiders. Just when you thought you might have had a minute or two to catch your breath and regain your composure. For gamers that are afraid of spiders, this must be their Cobra Pit. Seriously, Temple of Xi'an might be the best ever Tomb Raider level. But it's not my favorite. And number one. Marubu Gorge. This is it. Marubu Gorge is my all-time favorite Tomb Raider level. It's a controversial choice, I imagine, as Marubu Gorge by no means is a universally loved adventure. To me, however, the level excels in every single way. There are very few gaming experiences that operate on the same level of immersion as Marubu Gorge does, and that's why it's my favorite. When Lara explores this gorgeous location, so do I, as this level puts me right inside the level alongside Lara. Again, Tomb Raider 3 gives the player a wonderfully complex, non-linear and dangerous level with numerous paths to explore. The beautiful scenery and tranquility of the ever-present sound of the rapids is contrasted by the constant potential for instant death if Lara falls into said rapids. It's impossible to get anywhere on foot in this location, so Lara will need some transportation. Essentially, this level is infamous for the kayak. While the kayak will help Lara advance in this inhospitable environment, there's only so much it can do to protect Lara in a gorge of violent rapids and falls. The player needs to utilize whatever little control they have of the kayak to reach the final destination with as much health as possible. Even a sliver of health will be better than death, which is the more likely outcome. The kayak is very sluggish and difficult to control, but that's how it's supposed to be. This way the level perfectly encapsulates the sense of struggle against nature as Lara desperately tries to stay alive. Eventually Lara will get out of the kayak and must climb all the way back along the cave walls next to the river she just went down. Here she must pull a giant plug that hides the Temple of Puna beneath. This way the player gets to appreciate the architectural marvel of the level's design without a constant fear of death by kayak. Finally, the player must pass another incredibly difficult challenge as Lara must drop safely into the now-revealed entrance of the temple. 
Madubu Gorge is exhausting and transcends regular gameplay immersion with the level of stress it puts on the player. You simply don't defeat Madubu Gorge. You survive it. And so ends this journey. I truly believe that the original Tomb Raider games are the best video games ever made and nothing in my recent playthroughs for this ranking did anything but to solidify this opinion. This video is my love letter to the series I've loved for so many years now and I hope it showed. I'm grateful for being able to celebrate Lara's 25th anniversary with this project and I hope you've enjoyed watching. A big thank you to the talented people at Core Design for their contributions to my wonderful childhood memories. And thank you for watching. Take care.